Hi, how's everyone doing? I hope you're doing well. Uh, so this video is just to introduce you to Monkey Beach. Uh, I don't want it to be too long, so I'm just going to get started and jump right in. So I have the document open in Adobe Digital Editions. It's the same document I emailed you, and when I open it, I go to File, Add to Library, and then I can just find the document and open it up. So here we are on the first page. Uh, we're reading Monkey Beach by Eden Robinson. Published in 2000 by Vintage. So we've got here a uh, dedication. This is for Laura Robinson and Dean Hunt. So it's likely this is a relative of hers. And the dedication says, In dreams I hear you laughing and know that you are near. So it sounds like she can only hear these people in her dreams, which implies what? Um, most likely that they're dead. They're no longer with us, and loss of family members is a central theme in this book. So that sets up one of our themes right away. Um, our table of contents here. So the book is in four parts. Part two is the longest. Part three and four are the shortest. So we'll do part three and four together because they are so short. Um, we're gonna we're gonna study those two together. All right, so we're starting off here with the Heisler proverb. It is possible to retaliate against an enemy, but impossible to retaliate against storms. So what does this say here? Um, so the implication here is that nature is more powerful than humans, that humans are at the mercy of the earth, are dependent on the earth, and um, depend on the earth for everything that they have. So... That sets up another central theme of our book, uh, which is the power of nature or the interrelationship between humans and the natural world. Or um, I should say that humans are, I should make it clear that humans are part of the natural world. They're not separate from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the earth, that all beings are interconnected in this worldview. Okay, so here's part one. It's called Love Like the Ocean. I'm going to read the first little bit here, and we'll talk about it as we go. Six crows sit in our green gauge tree. Half awake, I hear them speak to me in Heisla. Laes, they say. Laes, Laes. I push myself out of bed and go to the open window, but they launch themselves upward, cawing. Morning light slants over the mountains behind the reserve. A breeze coming down the channel makes my curtains flap limply. Ripples sparkle in the shallows as a seal bobs its dark head. Laius, go down to the bottom of the ocean. The word means something else, but I can't remember what. I had too much coffee last night after the Coast Guard called with the news about Jimmy. Other things we could notice here, um, the morning light, that could be a symbol of rebirth. I mean, it's significant that we start off here in the morning um, with the character bathed in morning light. Um, there's also some nice um, alliteration here. Curtains flap limply as ripples sparkle in the shallows as seal bobs his uh, dark head. So we've got repetition of P sounds and S sounds here. Um, the other thing it sets up is the main plot. So Lisa's younger brother Jimmy has gone missing. Uh, and the main plot of the book deals with her. Lisa and her family trying to find Jimmy as Lisa remembers her past experiences with her little brother um, and all of her experiences with uh, in her community and with her the people in her community that have shaped who she is now. People pressed cups and cups of it into my hands. Must have fallen asleep four-ish. On the nightstand, the clock face has a badly painted Elvis caught in mid-gyrate. Jimmy found it at a garage sale and gave it to me last year for my birthday. That and a card that said, Happy day, sis. How does it feel to be almost two decades old? Rock on, Grandma. The Elvis clock says the time is 7.30, but it's always either an hour ahead or an hour behind. We always joke that it's on Indian time. I go to my dresser and pull out my first cigarette of the day, then return to the window and smoke. An orange cat pauses at the grassy shoreline, alert. It flicks its tail back and forth, then bounds up the beach and into a tangle of bushes near our neighbor's house. 
The crows are tiny black dots against a faded denim sky. In the distance, I hear a speedboat. For the last week, I've been dreaming about the ocean, lapping softly against the hull of a boat, hissing as it rolls gravel up a beach, ocean swells hammering the shore, lifting off the rocks in an ethereal spray before the waves make a grumbling retreat. Such a lovely day, late summer, warm. Look at the pretty fluffy clouds. Weather reports are all favorable for the area where his saner went missing. Jimmy's a good swimmer. Everyone says this like a mantra that will keep him safe. No one's as optimistic about his skipper, Josh, a hefty good time guy who's very popular for his generosity at bars and parties. He's also heavily in debt and has had a bad fishing season. Earlier this summer, two of his, crews, two of his crew quit, bitterly complaining to their relatives that he didn't pay them all they were due. They came by last night to show their support. One of my cousins said they've been spreading rumors that Josh might have sunk his Queen of the North for the insurance and that Jimmy's inexperience on the water would make him a perfect scapegoat. They were whispering to other visitors last night, but Aunt Edith glared at them until they took the hint and left. I stub out the cigarette and take the steps two at a time down to the kitchen. My father's at the table smoking. His ashtray is overflowing. He glances at me, eyes bloodshot and red-rimmed. Did you hear the crows earlier, I say? When he doesn't answer, I find myself babbling. They were talking to me. They said, Lias, it's probably clearly a sign, Lisa. My mother has come up behind me and grips my shoulders that you need Prozac. She steers me to a chair and pushes me down. So a few significant things here. Um, our main character, her name is Lisa Marie Michelle Hill. And the Lisa Marie comes from Elvis's, Elvis Presley's daughter, Lisa Marie Presley. Um, and part of the interest in Elvis comes from her uncle Mick, who loves Elvis. And so we see him pop up a few times in this book. Uh, so this just shows sort of the funny, humorous relationship she has with her brother. Um, we also see uh, her talk a little bit about her dreams. So uh, dreams are very important in this book. Um, she talks about, for the last week, I've been dreaming about the ocean. So uh, we'll notice in this book that Lisa's dreams have a meaning. Um, in some cases, they actually seem to predict what's going on, as do her daytime visions. And over here, we see uh, a day... Well, the crows, that's the first example of, of her daytime vision, unless you literally believe the crows are talking to her, which is another, um, you know, that's what Lisa believes. Um, so she talks, when she mentions this to her mother, or she mentions her mother's passing by, she's talking to her father, uh, her mother teases her and implies that she's crazy, that she needs psych meds. So this sets up a difference in the worldview between the mother and the daughter. So for sure, Lisa's mother doesn't believe the crows are real, and she's uh, teasing her daughter to, to point that out. Dad's old VHF is tuned to the emergency channel. Normally, we have the radio tuned to CFTK. He likes it loud, and the morning soft rock usually rackets through the house. As we sit in silence, I watch his cigarette burn down in the ashtray. Mom smooths her hair. She keeps touching it. They both have that glazed, drawn look of people who haven't slept. I have this urge to turn on some music. If they had found the saner, someone would phone us. Pan, pan, pan. A woman's voice crackles over the VHF. All stations, this is Prince Rupert, Coast Guard. She repeats everything three times. I don't know why. We have an overdue vessel. She goes on to describe a gill netter that should have been in Rupert four days ago. Mom and Dad tense expectantly, even though this had nothing to do with Jimmy. At any given moment, there are 2,000 storms at sea. Okay, so at any given moment, there are 2,000 storms at sea. Uh, think about what that means. Why did she point that out? Uh, so why did she choose to include that detail? 
Um, and if you relate it to the Heisla proverb that started the book off, uh, that you can retaliate against your enemies, but you can't retaliate at storms, it just shows how powerful the ocean is. Um, so that's, again, a central theme that pops up, and Lisa's relationship with the ocean uh, is, is an important thing to notice as you read through the book. I'm not going to read through this next little part here, um, but she's just talking about where exactly the land is and where the name Kitimat came from. So it's a little confusing. As she said, Kitimat, the name is actually a Tsimshin word because when the colonizers came and asked, what is this place? They asked people who weren't from the place. So um, it's not actually called that. The other confusing thing is that um, that when Alcan Aluminum came, they made another town called Kitimat. So there are two Kitimats, and they have a slightly different spelling. Okay, so this is the bottom of page six here. The next part we're going to read. There are no direct flights to Namu from the Terrace Kitimat Airport, so Mom and Dad are traveling to Vancouver on the morning flight. From there, they're flying into Bella Bella and then going by boat to Namu to be closer to the search. I shouldn't have told them about the crows. At least I didn't tell them about the dream. The night the Queen of the North disappeared, I saw Jimmy at Monkey Beach. He stood at the edge of the sand where the beach disappeared into the trees. The fog and clouds smeared the lines between land and sea and sky. He faded in and out of view as the fog rolled by. He wore the same clothes he'd had on the day he left, a red plaid shirt, black jeans, and the John Deere baseball cap Dad had given him. I must have been on a boat because he was far away and small. I couldn't see his face. When we were kids, Dad would tell us about Begues, the wild man of the woods. They were stories that Baba U had told him. Jimmy's favorite was the one where these two trappers go up into the mountains near Monkey Beach. At one point, they had to separate because the trail split. They put a Y-shaped stick at the crossroads. The trapper who finished his line first would point the stick into the direction of their camp. This first guy who finished checking the traps heard something big moving in the bushes ahead of him. He caught a glimpse of light brown fur through the leaves and thought it was a grizzly. Keeping his gun pointed in the direction of the shaking bushes, he left the trail, moving backwards as quietly and quickly as he could, thinking that if he stayed downwind, it wouldn't notice him. So he wasn't paying attention to what was behind him when he broke into a clearing. He heard a grunt. He spun around. In front of him were more than 20 very hairy men. They looked as surprised as he was. They were tall with thick brown hair on their chests, arms, and legs. Their heads were shaped oddly, very large and slanted back sharply from the brow. One of them growled and started towards him. He panicked and bolted back into the bushes, and they began to chase him. They were fast. He was quickly cornered at the foot of a cliff. He climbed up. They gathered at the bottom in a semicircle and roared. When they followed him up, he raised his gun and knowing he'd probably have only one shot, picked the leader. The trapper shot him in the head and the creature landed with a heavy thump at the bottom of the cliff. As the other Sasquatches let out howls of grief, grief the trapper ran. After he reached the beach and realized that no one was following him, he made his way back to camp. His partner wasn't there. The sun was setting and the trapper knew that he was going to have to wait until morning before he could go after him. He broke camp, put all the stuff into their boat, anchored out in the bay and spent the night wide awake. At first light, he headed up the mountain. When he got to the crossroads, he saw his partner, battered, bloody, and most definitely dead. Before he could get to him, the howling started all around, and he turned and ran. You're telling it all wrong, Mama U had said once when she was over for Christmas dinner. Every time Dad launched into his version, she punctuated his, glory, his gory descriptions with that's not how it happened. Oh, Mother, he'd protested finally. It's just a story. Her lips pressed together until they were bloodless. She'd left a few minutes later. Mom had kissed Dad's nose 
and said family was family. Mama Ooh's version was less gruesome, with no one getting shot and the first trapper just seeing the Baguettes crossing a glacier, getting scared and running back to the camp. Me and Jimmy liked Dad's version better, especially when he did the sound effects. Either way, when the trapper got back to the village, he had an artist carve a Sasquatch mask. At the end of the story, Dad would put on a copy that his father had carved and chase us around the living room. Jimmy would squeal in mock terror and pretend to shoot him. If Dad caught us, he'd throw us down and tickle us. Mama Ooh frowned on this. She said it would give us nightmares. Sure enough, Jimmy would crawl into my bed at, late at night when he thought I was asleep and curl into my side. He'd leave before I awoke, tiptoeing out. Jimmy took the story as if it were from the Bible. He brought himself, bought himself a cheap little camera one day, and I asked him why he was wasting his money. I'm going to make us rich, he said. I snorted. How? You're going to blackmail someone? I'd been watching soaps with Mama Ooh and knew all about cheating husbands and wives who were photographed in awkward positions. Jimmy shook his head and wouldn't tell me. Want it to be a surprise. All that week, he begged Dad to take him to Monkey Beach. How come, Dad said, getting annoyed. Because that's where the Baguettes are, Jimmy said. Dad raised an eyebrow. Jimmy squirmed. Please, Dad, please, it's important. Jimmy, Dad said, Sasquatches are make-believe, like fairies. They don't really exist. But Mama Ooh says they're real, Jimmy said. Your grandmother thinks the people on TV are real, Dad said, then glanced at me, rolling his eyes. After a moment, he leaned in close to Jimmy, whispering, You don't really want to get eaten, do you? They like little boys. Jimmy went pale. I know. He looked at me. I rolled my eyes upward. Only when it looked like Dad wasn't going to give in did Jimmy pull out a copy of the World Weekly Globe. He showed us page two where it said that the Globe would pay up to $30,000 to anyone who got a picture of a Sasquatch. We'll be rich, Jimmy said. So excited he began to hop. We can go to Disneyland. We can get a new car. I bet we could even get a new house. Dad stared at him. He patted Jimmy's shoulder. If you finish all your chores this week, we'll leave on Friday. Jimmy whooped and ran to tell Mom. I giggled. He was only a year and a half younger than me, and he was still such a baby. Well, Dad said with a wry smile, cockle season's starting anyway. Dad's Uncle Gordy and his wife Edith dropped off equipment for the trip that night. Again, this sets up a difference in worldview. So we've got Albert, Lisa's father, who believes that it's just a story. The Sasquatch is just a story. Um, but the Begues are, um, if you didn't already know, the, the Sasquatch stories we have now in popular culture come from indigenous oral tradition. And people certainly would have and still do, in some cases, believe that these are real stories, that they actually happened which is a question people often have. Do the people actually believe the stories, even though they're supernatural? Like a, a, little, a little man who pops up, keeps popping up, who's imaginary and only you can see, or crows speaking to you, for example. The types of things that can happen in this book. That is a question, are they real? Um, or are they a figment of Lisa's imagination? Are they just stories? Um, and that's not an easy question to answer. It depends on the individual. But certainly there would be people who do believe that uh, these are literal things and people who don't. So it just shows the variety of different ways of thinking about things. Okay, we're, gonna, we're just going to move ahead to uh, page 14, um, sort of near the top, about five, six lines down. Uh, Jimmy's about to um, try to jump off the boat to go take a picture of the... The Baguettes, they're on their Monkey Beach trip. By the way, um, this is an example of one of the flashbacks. We don't know exactly how old Lisa is here, but Jimmy is most likely around five, six. Um, so her, she being a year and a half older, probably seven or eight years old. Um, 
just to give you a rough idea of, of how old they are when this is happening. Don't worry too much about keeping track of the exact time. Um, it's not, it's often not easy to identify exactly what age Lisa is during her flashbacks and that's okay. As long as you have a rough idea of how old she is, that's fine. All right, so here we are. <clears throat> Put some bug dope on, Mom said to him. Jimmy leaned over the railing to dip his hand in the ocean. His legs dangled in the air. The water's still warm. Don't even think about it, Mom said, hauling him back in. It's not that far, he said. Your camera would get wrecked, dummy, I said. Dad and Uncle Gordy caught two more crabs before finally rowing the rest of the way back to us. I was anxious to start hunting for cockles, bending down and looking for places where the sand bubbled. Those suckers moved fast. I'd always liked it when they stuck their tongues out, until Mom told me those were really their legs. As soon as we touched shore, Jimmy leapt off the boat and ran for the woods. Years of babysitting instinct kicked in, and I sprinted after him. Mom and Dad were shouting in the background, annoyed. I tackled Jimmy, and we both fell flat in the sand. Mom cut up to us and pulled Jimmy to his feet by his ears. What do you think you're doing, young man? Making us rich, he said. I, Lisa, Mom said to me, stay with him and make sure he doesn't get into trouble. But, Jimmy and I said at the same time, don't argue with your mother, Dad said, or you can both go back to the boat. Jimmy almost started crying. He was getting older, though, less prone to throwing himself on the ground, kicking and screaming. When they started to set up a little camp, I dragged him down the beach to look for shells. We slept on the beach that night. We roasted warm marshmallows and some hot dogs on the fire. Aunt Edith boiled hers, saying her stomach wasn't what it used to be, and Uncle Gordy fell asleep without eating, snoring so loud that he sounded like a gill netter. In the morning, Jimmy was gone. Dad and Mom hunted one way up the beach, and Aunt Edith and Uncle Gordy went the other. They shouted Jimmy's name. I was supposed to stay at the camp, but I heard something crack in the trees. Jimmy? I said. I heard someone start to run. I found him, I shouted. I found him. Without waiting to see if anyone had heard me, I started to run after him. I'd catch glimpses of a brown shirt and hear Jimmy up ahead, but I couldn't catch up to him. I chased him as hard as I could until my side ached as if I'd been punched and I gasped for air. I could hear him ahead of me. I stopped, leaning over, consoling myself with the spanking Jimmy was going to get when we got back. Suddenly, every hair on my body prickled. The trees were thick, and beneath them, everything was hushed. A raven croaked somewhere above. I couldn't hear anyone calling for Jimmy. I could hear myself breathing. I could feel someone watching me. Jimmy? The sweat on my body was stinging cuts and scratches I hadn't been aware of before. It was drying fast, making my skin cold. I turned very slowly. No one was behind me. I turned back and saw him, just for a moment, just a glimpse of a tall man covered in brown fur. He gave me a wide, friendly smile, but he had too many teeth, and they were all pointed. He backed into the shadows, then stopped behind a cedar tree and vanished. I couldn't move. Then I heard myself screaming, and I stood there, not moving. Jimmy came running with his camera ready. He broke through the bushes and started snapping pictures wildly, first of me screaming and then of the woods around us. Jimmy was wearing a gray sweatshirt. I stared at him and he stared out at the bushes. Where are they? He said, excited. Doubt began to set in. It had happened so fast and had been so brief, I wondered if I'd just imagined the whole thing. Did you see them? Jimmy said. Which way did they go? Who? I said. The Sasquatches, Jimmy said. I thought about it, then pointed to the direction of our camp, and Jimmy started running back the way I'd come. I stayed for a moment longer, then turned around and left. So one hint that this is an important passage is, of course, that the title of the book is Monkey Beach, and usually the title um, alludes to something, some important aspect of the book, so we know this is important. Um, 
one thing that's happening here is Lisa's struggle with uh, coming to accept the spirit world, so accepting her visions as reality. So she's sort of, if we have um, Albert on one side or, you know, her parents on one side and Mama U on the other, her parents not believing that anything is real and Mama U believing that oral tradition and mythology is real, Lisa's somewhere in the middle. And uh, a lot of the book deals with her trying to figure out um, where she stands on this uh, because she does have a gift. She's able to see the spirit world. You'll notice that it's Lisa who sees the Sasquatch and nobody else. And that's that's common throughout the book, that Lisa has access to, to certain things that other people don't. The next thing we're going to look at is on page 18 in your book. It's this weird little um, interlude here. Um, so we're going to try to figure out what this is all about. This is now Lisa at this age. She seems really young. Pay attention to the type of language that she uses. Um, so she says, I stood beside a ditch looking down at a small dark brown dog with white spots. I thought it was sleeping and climbed down to pet it. When I was near enough to touch it, I could see that the dog's skin was crisscrossed by razor thin cuts that were crusted with blood. It had bits of strange cloth tied to its fur. The dog whimpered and its legs jerked. Someone sssst. I looked up. A little dark man with bright red hair was crouching beside me. Your doggy, I said. He shook his head then pointed towards my house. Lisa, mom yelled from her front porch. Lunchtime. Come see doggy, I yelled back. Lisa, lunch, now. Later, I dragged mom to the ditch to see the dog. The flies had found it. Their lazy, contented buzz and the ripe smell of rotting flesh filled the air. Uh, okay, so this is kind of a dreamlike interlude. Um, Lisa's not speaking in full sentences. She says, come see doggy. So it sounds like she's about four or five. She's, she's really young at this point. So over on page 20, um, the paragraph that's about halfway through, where it says, the memories are so old that I used to think the little man and the dog in the ditch were a dream. I'm sure that was the first time I saw the little man. So this shows um, that the little man's going to pop up again. And then she says, um, I'm sure that was the first time I saw the little man. That was the day before the tidal wave. So we'll notice a pattern here with the, the little man. When he pops up again, page 21 on your book. Um, and he pops up before another important event. So that's, a, that's an important thing to notice in the book. When the little man comes, something happens, usually the next day. So when she was a little girl, it was this brutal, and it might have been the first time when Lisa was little that she had seen anything like death or suffering. or um, So that dog was a significant moment in her life, and that's why the little man chose that moment to pop up. So then Lisa goes on to talk, to, talk about the next time she sees the little man. Um, so she says, the next time was when I was six. I woke up with the eerie feeling that someone was staring at me. I clutched my ratty teddy bear, Mr. Boo Boo. When I finally got up the courage to peek out of my blankets, I could see by the moonlight that there were no monsters ready to grab me and drag me into dark places and do terrible things to me. My eyelids were pulling closed and my death grip on Mr. Boo Boo was loosening when my jewelry box fell off my dresser. I jolted awake, heart thudding so hard I couldn't breathe. My jewelry's box tinkling, tinny music played, but I heard it only somewhere in the distance because I was staring open-mouthed at the red-haired man sitting cross-legged at the top of my dresser. His crinkling face arranged itself into a grin as he rolled backwards and stood. He tilted a head that was too large for his body, put one stubby finger to his lips, and went, Shh. Frozen where I lay, I couldn't have made a sound. 
His green plaid shirt jingled with tiny bells as he bowed to me. Then he straightened until he was standing again and stepped back into the wall. I didn't move from under the covers until Mom knocked on my door and said it was time to get my lazy bones out of bed. I told her about the little man and she gave me a hug and said, everyone had bad dreams and not to be scared of them. They were just dreams and they couldn't hurt me. We found out at the bottom of page 21 that it's the day after she sees the little man that second time. Um, it's Gladys's birthday. And Albert bought her, uh, or got her some jars of cockles for her birthday. And she teases him about that. Uh, and then on page 22, about halfway down, we're introduced to a new character. So it says, later in the morning, while mom checked the seals on the jars of cockles, the doorbell rang. I jumped up to get it. When I opened the door, I was looking up at a tall, deeply tanned man with black hair pulled back in one long braid. Hey, short stuff, he said. Your mommy home? Mom came up behind me, stopping suddenly. I turned in time to see her smile freeze. Oh my god. The man held out a single pink salmon berry flower. Surprise! So clearly Gladys here is shocked to see him. Another thing to note is that it seems like nobody's seen Mick in a while, um, but he still remembers Gladys's birthday. So at the bottom of page 23, um, Al reacts to just seeing his brother. He says, uh, Jesus, Dad said, leaning over like he's been, he'd been punched in the stomach. Jesus, you okay, Al? What's the matter? What? The man said. Dad put his shaking hands over his face and stayed bent over, shuddering. It took me a moment to realize he was crying. Go away, I shouted at the man. Get out. Go away. Stop it, Lisa, Mom said. Al, the man said. Jimmy came running into the hallway. Daddy? Dad wiped his face and said, it's okay, it's okay. I pushed myself between them and glared up at the man. You go away. The man knelt down and smiled at me. You know who I am? I'm your Uncle Mick. No, you're not. Uncle Mick's in jail. The man burst out laughing. After a minute of silence on everyone else's part, he said as he stood up, You thought I was in jail? Why the hell do you think I was in the big house? So bottom of page 24, Mick finds out that uh, Lisa Marie got her middle name from him. That uh, She's named Michelle because his name is Michael. And on page 25, um, we find out why everyone thought he was in jail. So uh, Al, Al says, all your friends, they said you were shot and the FBI took you away. That's at the bottom of page 25. Mick's eyebrows went up. He turned to confirm this with mom and she nodded. He sat back in his chair and laughed so hard that the coffee came back up his nose, and he started choking. Mom pounded his back. You could have written, you could have phoned, but no. That would have been too much trouble. Okay, Gladys, now you're hurting me, Mick said, and she stopped hammering. Geez, I've been kicked and walloped and yelled at, and I haven't even been home a half hour. I was safer hiding out in the boonies, for Christ's sake. Oh, boo-hoo, Mom said sarcastically. You had us thinking you were being tortured God knows where. I didn't do it on purpose. You never do it on purpose. Enough, enough, Dad said. Let's just figure out a way to tell Mother without giving her a heart attack. While Dad and Mick went off to tell Mama Ooh the good news, Mom hauled the sack of cockles to the sink and began shucking them, popping cockles into her mouth, humming as she chewed. I was disgusted. Imagining the cockles cold and slimy, and said so. Mom laughed, then said the best part was the cockles wiggling in your mouth. I was afraid to sleep because of the little man's visit the night before. So again, um, 
we know, just a reminder, that the little man foreshadows important things, and in this case, foreshadowed something that's mostly positive, which was Mick's arrival, or re-arrival, back, back into the family. So on page 27, um, that first paragraph there, she's again, she's talking about the little man, and the next time she sees him um, is, she says, the night when the hawks came. And we find out more about that on page 37. So on page 28, uh, we find out that all of a sudden Al checked his bank account and saw some extra money in there. So he goes to the bank with Lisa, um, looks at his account, says to the teller, uh, I think there's been a mistake. There's a couple more zeros than there should be. And she says, is your brother Michael Hill? He says, yes. Uh, so um, apparently he dropped by saying he owed Al some money and that was paying him back. Uh, so on page 29, Al goes over to Mick's house trying to return the money, finds a woman in a terry cloth bathrobe, uh, and instead of taking the money, Mick convinces or forces Al to take them all out for ice cream. So when Al tries to give it back, he, he tells Mick you should invest it, and Mick says, I am. You're my bank of Al. Come Christmas, I'll be bumming off you and living in your basement. You'll see. So moving to bottom of page 130, top of page 131. Al is trying to help Mick do his taxes because he's been away for a while. Um, this shows that it's been multiple years since he's doing income taxes, which are, of course, annual. And he says... I don't see why we have to file at all, Mick said. The whole fucking country is on Indian land. We're not supposed to pay any taxes on or off reserves. God, don't start again, Dad said. This whole country was built on exploiting Indians for... Mick, Dad pleaded. Look at this. Mom was shaking her head. Nothing but craft. How does he stay healthy? I helped Mom by finding some wieners in the fridge. We began making a macaroni and wiener casserole. I'll make you a warrior yet, Mick said, punching Dad's shoulder. So this again shows difference in the way family members think. In this case, it's a political difference uh, rather than a spiritual difference. So the next little bit sort of sets up the way uh, Lisa's family lives. Talks about the new patio furniture and Gladys's new Royal Dalton dishes. Lisa's also talking about the uh, tidal wave that she mentioned uh, when she that she saw when she was very young. Um, so this was the, I believe, the little man's second visit when he came to warn her about the tidal wave. So she talks about how she climbed up into a tree and tried to see that when she was a little girl. So on page thirty-four, we learn a little bit about um, Al. Al becomes a gardener. So somewhere in, our, somewhere in our deepest past, in among eons of fishermen, there must have been a farmer. So he, he has a green thumb here. Uh, then he gets some chickens, and Mick makes fun of him for that. Bottom of page 36, top of page 37. Um, this is the event Lisa was talking about when she said she saw the little man the night before the hawks came. Um, so this was the day before the hawks came. Sometime later, when Uncle Mick was babysitting us, we heard a chicken clucking on the roof. We looked at each other, puzzled. Dad had covered the backyard with fish nets so the hawks wouldn't get at the chickens. Mick got a broom to chase it down, and Jimmy and I went uh, out to help him. To our, to our surprise, it was a crow imitating the chickens, pretending to peck at the roof and then gurgling so it sounded almost like it was laughing. I'll be damned, Mick said. The next morning, I awoke when I heard the chickens squawking. I thought they were fighting until I heard the hawks cry. 
I jumped up and ran to the window. There were large tears in the net over the coop. A chicken ran around and around, spurting blood from its missing head until it fell over. Another chicken ran through the yard with its guts trailing behind it, flapping its one wing, shrieking. A hawk plunged through the net, squashed the screeching chicken in its grip, and pecked its eyes. Mom chased the hawk out of the coop. She grabbed the half-eaten ch eaten chicken as it ran by her. She picked it up and snapped its neck. Dad pulled me away from the window and held me until I stopped crying. Seven of the chickens were killed that morning, and the rest escaped tr through the hole in the net and were hiding down on the beach. Mick and Dad tried to round them up, but the chickens had been badly spooked. They refused to be herded back. Reserve dogs got most of them. Foxes got others. Some German tourists ran over one on the highway, and the hawks finished off the rest. So this is another time when the spirit world uh, revealed something to Lisa. So the crows told her uh, the day before, and the little man told her in a dream the night before. And again, it was a warning about something uh, brutal that happened. And on page 42, we meet um, Lisa and Jimmy's two cousins, Tab and Erica. So they have different parents. Tab's mother is Trudy, and Erica's mother is Kate. So Tab is uh, sort of an unpopular kid. She's a little bit, doesn't quite fit in. Um, and Erica is one of the popular girls and has lots of uh, girlfriends. She's sort of one of the mean girls. So page 44, 45, Lisa uh, continues to remember this event. Um, Jimmy is about six, so she's about seven or eight, and Jimmy does something dangerous. He jumps off the breakwater logs, which worries her uh, because he's, well, he's only six. Um, and she says she watches him until she sees his head pop up. We also, uh, top of page 45, we meet Adeline Jones, um, who captures all the boys' attention. He says, uh, it says, puppy dog-eyed boys watched her sunbathing, so she's clearly a bit of a boy magnet there. Um, we learned that Erica lives in a big house near the band council office. Um, and we'll see the difference. We'll see Tab's house a little later on, and you can contrast the difference there. Um, then Lisa leaves Jimmy there, and her mother gets upset with her. Uh, so, top of page 46, Gladys says, uh, Come here, Mom said. When I didn't, she came and stood over me. He wants to do everything you do. He wants to go where you go. You think he'll want that forever? He's going to go his way, and you'll go yours, and this is what you'll miss. Won't. Um, so it shows what Lisa's relationship with Jimmy is like at this point, how Jimmy feels toward her. Now, things change throughout the novel as they grow, their, their relationship changes, but at this point, um, he's sort of following her around like a little brother, like a, like a puppy dog. So page 45 to 50, we have a, a few more details about uh, Lisa and Jimmy. We find out that Lisa is scared of the water the dark and the unknown, and Jimmy, on the other hand, um, wants to be an Olympic swimmer, so a huge contrast there. And then we learn that Lisa's a little bit of a daredevil. She flies down the hill on her bicycle, uh, almost gets hit by a truck. The driver of the truck happens to be Uncle Gordy, who takes her, uh, puts, throws the uh, the bike in his the back of his truck and takes her home and then she gets in trouble for doing something so dangerous um, then on page 50 uh, so she's talking about um, the injury with the bike she says we're about halfway down here my wounds were still oozing and raw three days later when mom said I wasn't grounded anymore and I decided to go spend the day at my cousin Tab's. Her house was only a few years old, but it already looked run down. 
The walls had punched out holes and the carpet was gray and cigarette burnt. Her room was in an unfinished basement and never seemed to get warm. I liked going over to Tap's house because her mother didn't act like I was going to break something or watch me nervously like Aunt Kate when Erica had the gang over. So again, a huge contrast between the way Erica and Kate, or, or sorry, Erica and Tab live. And that has to do with their, their mothers. So Tab's mother is Trudy, who's an alcoholic. And Erica's mother is Aunt Kate, who seems relatively well-adjusted and seems to have um, a reasonable amount of money. So that is the first 50 pages of Monkey Beach. Um, I'm trying out this video format to see if it helps people um, because I know it can be tough reading from home. So let me know what you think. Was it helpful? Was it not helpful? Hopefully it was. And I hope everyone's enjoying the book. Take care.